A few words of introduction, so Himin Fang, our today's speaker, is a doctoral researcher at the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Longborough University, and her research explores the sociology of lifestyle, with a particular emphasis on examining the disparities in health and lifestyle experienced by migrant communities. So, Himin, you are also a Norbert Elias Fellow, an honor that we share in a wonderful, wonderful sense of belonging. And your interest is in exploring the relationship between social theory, migration, and health. And uh, Himin was also a visiting fellow at the Berlin Institute for Empirical Integration and Migration Research in 2023. So, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak today. And... Let us now hear about group charisma and disgrace in the context of physical activity. I mean, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Okay. So, um, yeah. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simin Fine. I'm a doctoral researcher at Loughborough University in the UK. So, um, um, today's before I start with today's talk first, I want, I want to take this opportunity to thank Marta and Marta and the Center of Figurational Research for inviting me to share my research uh, with you all. And I also want to thank you all for being here to listen to what I have to say. So um, uh, in today's talk, I would like to share with you my PhD progress. And I also want to say that um, I wish I could be there in person in Warsaw to talk to you all about my research. I was there, as Marta mentioned, in 2022 for the Elias conference, and Warsaw gave me the impression that it's a city with a lot of culture and intellectual history. But anyways, I, it is still my pleasure to um, have this opportunity today to discuss with you all your our understanding, our application, and maybe development for social research around on and around Elias's theory. So in the next 25 to 30 minutes or so, I will take you on a journey to explore the social relation and social processes of it, what is known to be one of the most unknown ethnic minorities in the UK, the British Chinese communities in the UK. And I will also, for the purpose of um, discussion around Elias, draw on some of the um, applica ap application and also my critical insights, I hope, um, on applying the established outsiders theory alongside my findings of the um, uh, empirical ethnographic field work. So without further ado. When I first started with the research, I was pondering on the problem of physical activity. I wondered what was the task, what was the further tasks for sociologists to do? Because we already have a really good number of answers, understanding and narratives to explain why maybe members of ethnic minorities or communities of migrants are less motivated or less capable in participating physical activity and exercises. And the common narratives and, and uh, maybe determinants that people would talk about would be practical constraints, fear of discrimination, language, and access of time, as well as ethnicity and more. But when I encountered these um, arguments, I felt it was at points, at times, static, and if you use uh, Elias's words, at times, egocentric to be detached human beings from their society to detach human beings as individuals rather than interdependent uh, human beings. And it was much more related to the narratives around social inequalities, simplifying the story that comes down to boil down to discrimination, that boil down to language, boil down to probably pr practical constraints, their jobs, etc. So I wasn't that much satisfied. And when I encountered the work of Elias, I noticed there's still yet something very important, a very important task to do left for our sociologists. That is to critically discuss the role or the behavior that um, people have, and especially in my case, ethnic minorities, British Chinese communities. So um, Elias's perspective helps us to understand human beings as 
pluralities rather than individuals who have different language time discrimination uh, experiences or practical constraints, but also to understand human behavior as outcomes of interdependent networks and to capture the social and processual development of social relation is what really made me um, made the foundation for my research. So today I want to present to you three central arguments of my research that uh, came out of my findings. So I hope it becomes clearer towards the end of the talk, but I will also explain them more with my findings. So one, the acceptance of the outside identity forms channels of resistance. That actually, uh, by using the theory of the subject outsider, there have been acceptance for the outside identity, but such ironically uh, uh, acceptance also formed or fueled resistance for the outsider community, which is the British Chinese community that I researched. And second, physical activity has been a source of power in which the um, Chinese community actually wanted to promote their, their own identity, a space for them. And thirdly, practical constraints combined with shared ideological identity reaffirmed inequality. So there were multiple dimensional of power that went through this process, not just done by the, like just not going through, through one stream of power, but it goes to multi streams of power that came from the ideological beliefs of the community. So the central um, research question of my uh, project lies on lies in the social processes uh, of the British Chinese and to understand their behavior of physical activity. I wanted to put more focus more on the social processes because physical activity was actually just a, a vehicle for me to um, basically understand the uh, social experience of the British Chinese community. So speaking of the established outsider relations, it is a theory that helps us to understand power differences as well as inequalities. It is actually closely linked with uh, Elias' central work on the civilizing process, in which he not only explored the long-term processes of long-term development of social figurations, but also the emergence of personality types that actually uh, emerged with the civilizing process. So um, he captured that actually, even though we have interdependence, interdependence does not mean mutual dependence. It meant actually more the different power differences uh, uh, exist in our society. And especially through the uh, forces of, uh, forces of um, harmonious, develop harmonious development doesn't actually uh, exist in the society. So through the forces of insecurity, because difference of power create insecurity and insecurity as well as possibility of um, oppression actually brought the um, balance of power as, as well as established outsider to the mind of Elias. So to bring, to bring his work further, he has uh, done a research with his student, Scottson, on uh, community research in a, in, a sit, in a industrial residence near Leicester that consisted of three living zones. I have a picture here that would illustrate to you how um, a British neighborhood would look like. And in these three living zones, they wanted to find an explanation, particularly about why people of the zone two were considered as more powerful, even though they share the same traditional measures such as ethnicity, ethnicity um, social class, social status, jobs, and languages compared to zone three. But people, members of the zone three, were considered lack in their virtue, less powerful, and the zone two consider themselves simply as better human beings. So why was that? They found that mechanisms were existing such as um, gossip, rule of the best. Rule of the best means that um, members of the more powerful group can construct themselves as better human beings through different narratives, which then develops into group charisma, the main concept that I will engage with today, and also then forms a sense of superiority and in response to that, a group disgrace was also formed that also maintains balance of power over time. So when I first, linked to the, uh, first looked into the theory, I uh, noticed that there are already some applications about the intersection with migration. And um, scholarly works focus on 
Turkish gas arbeiter in Germany, or Polish immigrant food stores in the UK, as well as immigrant students in Belgium. So I wondered how does the unique case of Chinese communities in the West would actually turn out to be um, telling us something new about established outsiders, I hope. So maybe now something about the British Chinese community. So there were different waves of migration in the UK as all, almost all migration communities. And um, it wasn't until 1980s that the British government started to pay attention to the Chinese population to be uh, maybe a growing, ever growing um, community. So they have, talk they have talked about the Chinese community in their community hearing in the parliament, and they have mentioned five problems that existed within this community. So they have framed it as lack of English language, ignorance of social and other rights, cultural differences, skilled but scattered settlement, and the long unsocial working hours in the catering niche. So this was definitely, we don't like regardless of whether it has developed or not, but such a sentiment definitely existed since it has been first raised in the 1980s. Then I started to think about the processual development of this complex British Chinese identity because of the three factors that I also list here. I wonder whether the Chinese community should be, as an identity, viewed homogenous. And also, given the wide diversity in the countries of origin, um, the languages they speak, probably the religion, as well as political allegiance, and also whether ethnicity alone can tell me about the British Chinese community and their behavior, including in physical activity. So with this um, as a condition of the British Chinese community in the UK, I've designed my study as the following. Um, because there are less um, literature available about the British Chinese community, I took a more um, exploratory approach that is based on ethnography. That helps me to understand the group culture and community culture. So I did a uh, six months long um, ethnographic field work with a Chinese community center in a large site city in, the, in England, which were consider, considered as the second largest Chinese population in the UK. So I not only observed or stayed with the group and on their daily kind of behavior and uh, affairs, and I also um, observed two programs that focuses on promoting walk for leisure, outdoor activities, and another one was shuffle dance, as you can see from the picture on the, on the right, that um, mostly practiced by Chinese, a cultural dance. So we have, um, I, I've, I wanted to capture a diverse range of participants given the complex identity. So I included a variety of range, uh, age, including from 25 years old to 60 years old, and also a diversity in their countries of origin. Um, and also included both old and new migrants. Here's interesting because I included participants who are living in the country since 40 years, and as well as participants who are in the country since one month, and also the British born Chinese as well. So um, it is then interesting to understand how um, different time that you spend in the, in the, in the host country as Elias has considered would actually mean to, the, um, to your identity. So as first, as the first finding, first layer of finding was about the acceptance of the outsider identity. There were clear signs. Um, first of all, signs of gossip. Um, it was interesting because the gossip signs in my research have been very subtle. Um, it wasn't much because I didn't have the opportunity to actually also research the British community. It was mainly about the British Chinese community. But even then, through my observation of the ethnographic fieldwork, I captured subtle signs of gossip. I have here two examples. One would be at the train station example, where the group gathered at the gathering point in front of train station to wait for the day trip by taking the train. And uh, the law for um, lifting the mask wearing uh, was lifted very early in the UK. So maybe a month ago of that time, no one actually wears masks anymore, especially the uh, white British population. And we were the only group, the Chinese community, as you can see from the pictures here, were the only group that was still wearing masks throughout their activities, wherever they go, indoor, outdoor. So they were very ob obvious. And some of the white British people passing by, unfortunately, would show some murmuring and some face 
uh, of annoyed face expression. And similar things happen in the city walks as well as we are a group of 40, 50 Chinese people walking together with a mask. So I wanted to add here also a bit more about what the concept of gossip actually uh, has been com uh, constructed by Elias in his book in Scotsum. So they mentioned that topics based on common norms and beliefs were forming gossips. So if we think about this example here, about the pandemic, there's a lot of conspiracy going on, whether the, whether the virus came from China. So when you see a big group of Chinese people wearing masks, as a, as, a, as a person probably you wouldn't feel much safe to some extent based on the common norms and beliefs you experience in the society. And also gossip is a tool to keep a community from, from functioning and a source of unity for a social group. And it can take explicit and implicit forms. This then made me ponder on in which such uh, situation would gossip be more explicit and which would be more implicit, and which I will talk about also a bit later. So, and also at the same at the same time, every piece of news would feed into the gossip. So, if you would see a group of Chinese gathered in front of a uh, train station, this would then be maybe a piece of news that you would share within your community that then forms into a gossip as a whole. So with the gossip signs that I've observed with the uh, ethnographic fieldwork, um, the Chinese community actually showed acceptance. I found evidence in their acceptance, of, especially about three things. So the first thing is the acceptance to their outsider identity. So as you can see from the three quotes here, Tom mentioned, after I asked her about her experience or her feelings of having this experience of train station or city walk, that having received the annoyed face expression and murmuring, she said, if they would change, they would have done it a long time ago. What I do in response to them will not change anything. If anything happens, it will be just trouble for everyone. Gwen mentioned as well, the fear of being discriminated against is preventing me from going out for a walk as often as I would want to, or at least I would think twice. This is then developing about um, the behavior of physical activity. And finally, Charlie Lam, who was the uh, organizer of, of the outdoor activity group mentioned, many of the participants you see here experience worse than this. So having been a teacher, and he was actually a professor before he came to the UK, having been a professor my whole life, I believe that you cannot change them by doing anything now. So that's the first layer, the outside identity. The second layer would be the internalization of biological differences. So um, when it comes to physical activity, the British Chinese generally held the view that the, um, there is a biological differences physically. As Kitty Lam mentioned, I don't think I can ever be like them, but I try my best to learn from them. British are better in physically demanding sport than us. And this is also added by Gwen, who mentioned, I believe everyone can do sport if you really want to for yourself, but it is true that the social pressure makes it difficult. I don't think you can blame any minority individual, but I do think our bodies from China are used to the yellow water and soil, which is often means natural environment of a habitat that our people depended on for thousands of years. So the British are definitely different in this sense biologically. And third here, Becky mentioned, I tell my son to not go head on with his classmates in PE classes. We are different ethnicities and are good at different things. So the second layer is about biological differences that they have accepted and internalized. So the third lens would be um, the British Chinese identity. As I have mentioned already, the British Chinese community is actually quite a diverse group with complex identities. And many of them had not much to do with China, which is known as mainland China. So Gwen, for example, mentioned here again, I can feel how the British are looking at me when I go out for a walk with a mask, but I simply want to protect myself, meaning she has accepted the fact that it's happening. I don't even know anyone in mainland China, but it seems some British do not understand that, that they think I'm actually from China. So acceptance of the three layers, the outsider identity, the internalization of biological differences, and the British Chinese community, uh, British Chinese identity actually um, forced the 
a community to bring a level of acceptance. We have acceptance, but we also have, on the other side, uh, resistance. So as you can see here, many of the participants actually consider the Chinese hold a secret recipe to a healthier lifestyle. And this then helped them to resist the biological differences um, that they have mentioned about physical um, capabilities. And they believe they have charisma in other things that includes diet, health strategy, and medicine. And they then could develop a sense of superiority that at least internally to help themselves to heal a group charisma. So as you can see from the quote here by Theosek, he mentioned, if I had to choose, I think the Chinese lifestyle in terms of health is just innovatively better. It is practiced through changing every aspect of your life, inclusive of exercising. For this reason, I can practice a particular movement easily when I have a short break and I do not need to travel anywhere. He's then linking this to exercise like going to the gym or participating in the gym class that you have to travel. At the same time, Kitty Lam mentioned, we as Chinese have a different lifestyle. We have our own health strategy. The British people are used to hard sport in their genes, such as jogging in the cold, rainy, windy weather. Our body is just not designed for that. And I don't think I will ever be able to do that. She said it with such a pride, relaxation, instead of sense of inferiority. And also Candy Wu mentioned, sweating too much is also not ideal for your health, according to Chinese medicine. So here we see a sense of resistant charisma, as well as acceptance from the British Chinese community. So with this, I found that physical activity had been a venue of uh, power dynamics in which the group disgrace formed for them actually helped them to accelerate a gradual development of group culture to accept the we identity. But at the same time, this meant to them that accepting the sport and exercises of the British meant the acceptance of their lifestyle. The British Chinese considered that the British lifestyle were unhealthy. Their diet, their lack of health awareness was simply not as good, the as, good as the Chinese health philosophy. And becoming too British is a potential disgrace to their Chinese identity. And at the same time, physical activity then took a social function that it helps the British Chinese to, uh, to strengthen their power and also to um, basically participate in the British dominant exercises hindered their efforts to be building a strong Chinese identity, sense of Chinese identity. So if I could draw on some critical theoretical insights that I have applied or uh, discovered through my application of the established outsider theory, I would first talk about the gossip visibility. Compared to Elias and Scottson's study, which had a clear sign, clear evidence of gossiping about the outsider group, I believe the level of power of competition might have something to do with the visibility of gossip, in which case the zone two and zone three in Winston Parva had a really clear competition and power, balance of power because they share, they worked in the same factory, industrial basis. They have, they're competing to some extent in their living spaces. But when it comes to a more complex social relation in the in the outside world, not in the community context, context, I feel the gossip visibility did not need to be so strong, even for the um, for the matter of balance of power. That's um, one of my insights. And secondly, there were simultaneous established outsiders. Um, and as many scholars have um, identified who have applied the savage outsider theory, it should not be understood as, as dichotomous, but I would rather take it as a processual development. As you can imagine, comparing the Chinese people who are living in the UK since 40 years and the Chinese people who just arrived one month ago, there are differences compared to their identity. And you could argue internally there were established outsiders relations. And also, uh, moving on from there, there were actually multi-dimensional conception of power, in which case it wasn't just one dimensional, meaning it wasn't just about the British, white British, rest of majority society kind of project discrimination or stigmatization to the Chinese. It was also about the acceptance, the resistance that the Chinese community built that also maintained the balance of power, that also maintained the difference in the power, dif uh, in the power structure. So as some takeaway messages, I would 
say in short that it was not just the prejudice, but also the self-perception of the British Chinese that has developed a lack of motivation or a lack of interest in physical activity and power differences are basically not maintained by unidirectional forces. It was basically power goes both ways. And the acceptance and resistance could be the proof of, of, my, uh, of my claim here. And when it comes to group charisma and disgrace. And I also found physical activity, interestingly, as a useful lens for observing the social inequalities. And finally, to bring it back a bit to the empirical case that I have done, I believe the British Chinese are likely to continue with their own activities for the simple consideration of power. So that's all from me. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to receive any questions.